take a seat. Rest your weary feet. Enjoy the warmth of the fire. Here, have your favourite drink. It's time to speak about our gods and heroes, of stories that have echoed down the centuries to meet our eager ears. It's a glorious night, so sit back and enjoy. Let's turn our eyes from Midgard and to another realm entirely, to a place where the dead walk and wander, and to the goddess that oversees them, Hel. Her name means to conceal, to cover, to hide, to protect, and she shares this name with her realm itself. Away from the seeming shining heights of Asgard and the other worlds, Hel rules in a place they so often feared. Somewhere that is hidden away, shielded from the eyes of mortals. It reflects the story of how she came to rule that place. Tossed aside by the gods who wanted to distance themselves from her due to her nature, her image, and the heavy looming chains of prophecy. Hell, similarly to her parents and siblings, is so often demonised and likened to her Christian counterpart living in a fiery pit of eternal damnation and suffering. But she is no devil, and her realm is no flaming hellscape. Despite her visage, described as half dead, sometimes black, sometimes blue, and drained of life, and half living flesh, inviting revulsion, as perhaps the Aesir saw her, she dutifully fulfills a task she did not choose, to oversee and rule over the dead. Many today see her as a caretaker, as do I. Someone who was cast aside and feared, who nonetheless took the duty she was given. She knows that those that find themselves in her realm, perhaps like her, did not choose it themselves, especially if we are to believe the law in this regard. Those that were taken too young, or in the midst of sickness or old age, or those that simply did not die in battle. She takes them all and watches over them. Hell's realm is a place where many of our ancestors reside, to once again see each other and share stories of their lives, to smile and laugh and hug and cry. It is not a place for punishment, but a place of rest after your hammer, your physical form, takes its final sleep and is left behind in Midgard. This image of Hell is how many modern worshippers see her, a goddess who didn't choose her fate, a goddess who was cast aside out of fear of the future, a goddess who ultimately cares for those that enter her domain. It's the latter here that I would like to emphasise. It says something about her character that the lore and stories that we do have say that hell isn't cruel. She doesn't punish those that fall under her rule or otherwise lash out from a place of vengeance or a sense of justice. But a word of warning. As humans, we fear death. It is seen as the antithesis of our being. We thrive in the light, in fertile fields and bustling cities, looking so much like bees in a hive. We are taught to fear death in a society that so often sees our final fate as resting on a tightrope between everlasting bliss and eternal wrath. We flinch and recoil from death when we stumble upon it. It is seen as a horror, leaving us in a state of shock and emptiness. We grieve, we mourn at the absence of a person, the person-shaped hole they leave in our lives, as we all try and make ourselves whole again and move on, but never really moving on. We are left with scars that no physical wound can leave, deep and frayed. This is the nature of living a mortal life. We have a beginning and an end and a final end that we cannot know. Hell is a goddess that in some ways represents all of this, of the horror, the unknowable, the mourning and the grief. She resides in a place that no living mortal has ever stepped. Those that worship hell have to approach a goddess that represents so much of what we fear and do so without fear, but respect, kindness. It's a journey. We are but flesh, blood and brains living in a world that will continue long after we are gone. We are ephemeral, but we leave our mark on the world in the people we interact with. 
We spin weird of our own making. Contribute to the greater web. There's solace in that as a heathen. The idea that a tapestry's design can only really be seen when you step back and not linger on the individual threads that contribute it. We all matter. And what we do can reflect back on the world in ways that we cannot know, rippling across the weave. But enough of that sort of talk. Let's move on to the lore. Much of what we know about Hell sits neatly into the poetic and prose Edda. In Grimnismal, we know that one of the roots of the great world tree Yggdrasil extends into her realm. One of the three roots that dip also into Midgard and Jotunheim. Hell is mentioned in passing here and there alongside her vast halls, and those that die are said to pass into these halls or otherwise walk into Hell's care. As it is, the bulk of what we know comes from the prose Edda, and it's here that we get more of her history. We are told that she is one of the three children of Loki and Angabotha, alongside the wolf Fenrir and the world serpent Jormungandr. Snorri describes how there's prophecies, namely that which we see in the Voluspa, of these children creating mischief, like their father, alongside immense disaster. The gods grow concerned, but none more so than Odin, who orders that the children be plucked from their home and brought to him. Jormungandr is tossed into the ocean, Fenrir taken by the gods, with Tyr being the only one brave enough to approach him. Odin, upon seeing Hel's half-dead appearance, throws her into Niflheim and gives her the right to rule over the dead. Specifically, as Snorri emphasises, those that died of sickness and old age. Snorri here also perhaps dips a little too much into creative license, and it is here that we get a description of her main hall, El Yusnir, that which is damp with rain and sprayed with snowstorms. There's a knife called famine, a bed, sickness bed, a dish called hunger, a servant, Ganglati, and a serving maid, Ganglote, lazy walker. The threshold is called stumbling block, and the curtains shine with light gleaming. It is a place of opposites, a place of misery. Perhaps unsurprising, Snorri also describes hell here as rather downcast and fierce. Hell also plays a significant role in the death of the god Baldr. Upon his death, Frigg pleads with the gods to travel to Hell and beg for her son to return to her. Side note, they also find it interesting that Baldr died of neither old age or sickness and still ended up in Hell. Damn you, Snorri. Anyway, the god Hermod volunteers and travels on the back of Sleipnir to make his case. He arrives and finds Baldr and stays the night. The following morning, he approaches Hel and pleads for Baldr's return, as he promised Frigg he would do. He speaks on the gods' misery and how they miss the golden god of Asgard. Indeed, the world must be mourning for Baldr, so beloved as he is. Upon hearing this, Hel essentially wants to test whether Hermod is exaggerating, or if he is speaking the truth. She says that she will let Baldr return to the gods if all things in the world weep for him. Everything weeps for him. If it is indeed true that he is beloved, as Hermod says, this should be a simple task. But if anyone refuses to cry, or otherwise objects, then he will remain with her. Now, long story short, there is one being, a Jotun named Thok, who refuses to weep which is highly suspected to be Loki in disguise, and Hel keeps that which is rightfully hers. During the events of Ragnarok, if they so should come to pass, it is said that Hel's realm will open up, and all those that were in her halls will arrive with Loki on Vigritha, the final battlefield. Hel is also mentioned incredibly briefly over the course of Heimskringla and Egil's saga mostly in phrases such as Hell's Companion referring to Baldr, or otherwise used to refer to the process of death and dying. Given to Hell, Hell does hold him to join the company of the monstrous wolf sister, and so on. But we do have one interesting piece of information to be found in Book 1 of Saxo Grammaticus's History of the Danes, and the story of King Hadding. 
Here, Saxo offers a different image of Hell's Realm that Snorri describes. One night, while Hadding was dining, a woman was seen to raise her head from the ground, holding hemlock. She asked the king, in what part of the world may fresh plants such as this grow in the depths of winter? The king did not know, but he expressed an interest to find out. And so she whisked him away to a place that the living should not walk. But they walked together through a veil of darkness, then along a well-traveled path, passing by nobles in purple robes and travelers equally well-dressed. They eventually came upon a sunny region, which had produced the vegetation that the woman had revealed in the land of the living. They then approached a river with black-blue water, with weapons traveling in its currents. Over a bridge, they encountered a war of two evenly matched armies. The woman explains that these are men that met their death by the edge of a sword, and they are trying to recapture the victories lived in life. Onward yet they travelled, until they met a vast wall which could not be passed. The woman then rings the head of a cock that she had apparently been carrying somewhere on her person and threw it over the wall. Shortly after, they heard the sounds of the bird given life once more. It is here that we get another image of Hell's realm. It is no place of misery and rain or pit of fire, but a place that in its own way is full of rejuvenation and activity. The dead once again regain their abilities granted them in life. With all of this in mind, it's fair to say that the Lord doesn't give us much to work from as heathens. Though hell herself is seen as fair, just, caring. Those that die are said to go into her hold. You can almost imagine her arms as they wrap around a departed soul in comfort. She is not evil. She reflects the pluralist nature of the gods themselves. There's no great good versus evil here, but multifaceted and complex beings, of which we know startlingly little. Hell is not to be feared. Perhaps, if the feeling ever takes you, offer her a beverage of your choice. Light a candle and talk and share with her. Laugh and smile. Tell her of your ancestors. Ask her perhaps to pass on messages of love. Thank her for the time, for she looks after the dead and will perhaps look after you when your time comes.